I work for the European Space Agency since uh, reasonably long time. Some of you have already introduced myself to, but it was, was a few different faces than this morning. Uh, I'm the Director of uh, Technology, Engineering and Quality. So my people really work on technology R&D and on supporting the projects of the agency as integrated support and functional support. And of course, uh, its policy needs that, that each project will have quality and product assurance personnel who report to the project manager and separately to me as a guarantee that there's an independent PA function within the project themselves. Uh, I'm an aerospace engineer myself. I worked 30 years in the agency. I have a separate hat as I've been mean, last six years director, and uh, I have a separate hat as director of ESTEC, which is the research entity of the agency. It's about half of the agency personnel work in, uh, in ESTEC. So, what I thought to present today to you is a sort of uh, a quick overview of our programs because, and, and I say a quick overview because we have one hour time, but uh, uh, you can find most of our program on our website. So uh, I can give you uh, an idea of what we do, but it's, uh, if you want to go into more detail, you go on our website and can get a data dump on any of these missions, etc. And then I would like to spend a little bit more time on what we do in my directorate in terms of technology, how we decide our technology strategy, uh, what do we want to do with it, and in particular, as we are uh, looking at also not only developing technologies but also quantifying them, uh, we are also the ones who are running small missions. Uh, all the way down to CubeSats. So perhaps I'll give you a little view of uh, that. Uh, I'm Italian, which means I talk a lot. So if we expect to have 10 minutes for questions at the end, it'll probably never work. So uh, wherever you uh, find something that you want to know a little bit more about, or you don't understand what I say, which it's easy with my accent, or something like that, please stop me and ask me. Uh, let's not make this a uh, formal thing. In any case, we have a few people around the table, so we can do that. So here we start uh, very rapidly. ESA is an international organization. It was founded more than 50 years ago. So what does it mean? We are really like uh, the OCDE or uh, UNESCO in a sense. Uh, a number of member states, European member states, initially 10, now 22, have signed agreement among them to do space activities together. And uh, when they decide that they will invest some money for a space mission with ESA, that money becomes part of their national law and they have to, uh, it's an international agreement, so they have to put that money up because otherwise they would be in breach of an international agreement. Which means we're not the European Union, but we're not an agency of the European Union. We work with the European Union, and we actually procure the two largest space activities for the European Union, Galileo and Copernicus, but we are a totally separate entity because the European Union is like a federal state with responsibilities given to it by the member states, while we are working for the member states. So our council, where all the member states sit, is the one telling us what to do. The European Union can tell the member states what to do in the domains that the member states decided are for the European Union. We're peaceful. We don't do anything uh, on the military side. Uh, by uh, convention. Uh, we have now, as I mentioned, 22 member states. Uh, 
most uh, like the uh, European Union, uh, but uh, we have also Switzerland and Norway, who are not in the European Union. We don't have some of the European Union member states like uh, Cyprus, uh, Malta, uh, some of the uh, member states of the European Union there, but we have more or less cooperation agreements with all of them. We have a long-standing cooperation agreement with Canada. Uh, mentioned quickly this morning, uh, we are a little bit unique in two ways. We are the only space agency in the world with reports to 22 governments, which makes decision-making a little bit slow. But on the other hand, it makes it very reliable. Once you get them all to agree, uh, it takes even more time to undo the decision. So we are collaborating with basically all the agencies in the world because we're kind of very reliable. The other thing, because Europe doesn't have much of a uh, defense space industry, uh, we end up doing most of the um, activities that in other uh, agencies are doing in other states or countries are done by the military. So we are the ones who developed all the launchers in Europe. We are the ones who are developing the navigation systems. We are developing most of the Earth observation systems and most of the telecom systems. We are a matrix organization, which means we have uh, uh, a director of space science, a director of human space flight and exploration, director of Earth observation launchers, uh, director of navigation, director of telecom, and these two directors serve all of the other directors' support. Uh, to give you an idea, we're about 2,200 staff and about uh, 1,500 contractors, so all in all we're about 4,000 people, and uh, my director in particular is about 750 people. We have places around the world, of course, uh, the centers are primarily in Europe, with uh, uh, ESTEC, which is up here, uh, being the largest center, which basically we have half of the personnel of ESA. So all of the other centers together make up our center. <coughs> we have offices like here in Moscow and in Washington and Houston. And we have, of course, uh, our launching base in Sioux, uh, uh, Guyana. And in order to follow with a deep space network our probes, we have antennas in uh, New Norcia, Malaria, and uh, Sibiris in uh, Europe. Uh, we have a budget which is about 5.7 billion but, uh, euros, but of that budget, the one that is properly easy is about 3.5. This is the budget that our member states give us. The other uh, 1.2 more or less come from our third party customers. And our third party customers are the Commission for Galileo and for Copernicus and Irmitsat principal. So Irmitsat, we are uh, procuring for them, we're developing uh, Matersat and, uh, uh, Matersat and Metal. And we're procuring the recurrent plot on behalf of Eumetsa and then Eumetsa operates. Uh, this gives you an idea that in the distribution of our budget, about one fourth of the budget is going to Earth observation. We are probably the largest provider of uh, climate change data from space in the world. So this is a big uh, interest for Europe and for, for us. Uh, launchers are big right now for the simple reason that we are in the middle of the development of two new families of launchers. So we have uh, Ariane 6, which is the new version of Ariane, but it's kind of radically different from the last. <coughs> and we have Vega C, which is an evolution of Vega itself. <coughs> Uh, we're not noted for a lot of uh, fantasy in the names. <laughs> we went from Aria 1 to Aria 6. And some people are thinking about Aria 7. So that's, that's more or less where we are. 
Uh, navigation is again a big block, but again, all of this money is actually coming from the Commission. Space science is a big part of what we do, and uh, basic activities are our basic research center. What is interesting here, in a sense, is that these slides that correspond to about, uh, let me say, about 15% uh, uh, of, of our total budget is a fee all member states have to pay to participate in these programs. And it's mandatory, which means that our space science program, with a difference to all the other programs, is decided by scientists. The money is there. So uh, the scientists are the ones who decide what is the most important mission to do. And that's a little bit unique, but it's also the way that our, it, it does, uh, let's say, justify why we are reasonably successful in terms of science. Um, human space is about 11%, and it's basically mostly our cooperation with the International Space Station with Russia, US, Canada, and Japan. Um, let's say that uh, today about 50% of the total uh, space uh, uh, spending is uh, from ESA member states, uh, and the rest is more or less uh, uh, ESA, EC, and uh, I mean, it's part of the EZC, etc. The total uh, space industry is about 35,000 jobs. So it's not, a, it's not a large industry by any means. And I think in terms of the European GDP, it's less than 100,000. Uh, we are an R&D organization, and a procurement organization, if you will. But that means we don't exploit commercially what we uh, develop. So for operational and uh, exploitation for meteorology, we created Airsat. <coughs> for launch services, we created Ariane Spas. For telecoms, we created Airtelsat and Imarsat. These two have now been privatized, so they're private companies. They don't, their links with us are more in, uh, in terms of R&D, but they don't uh, use our satellites anymore. Ariane Spas, of course, the link is much Closer because they commercialize mainly our launcher, plus Soyuz launched from our Kourou base in uh, South America. And here with that, they're still governments, uh, but not exactly our same governments, and we have a link, as I said, because we need our program. Um, we're not only uh, developing things with the money we have, but we have to develop them in the country that gave us money for it. So, our problem is to build a satellite, not with 200 million, but with 200 million of which 5% have to go back to Switzerland, 10% have to go back to Italy, 20%, etc. And according to the interest of the member state, uh, they can finance differently the optional programs. It's only the space science that's mandatory for all to the GDP scale. But for instance, France is very interested in launches. So 50% of the launches budget comes from France. Germany is very interested in manned space. 40% of our manned space funding comes from Germany. Uh, Italy and UK are very interested in Earth observation and telecom. So together they finance about 30-40% or of those programs. But that also means that, that money has to go back to industries in those countries. And of course, uh, these countries being the biggest payers, they also like to choose where it goes. So you're, as, as a research organization, we're also a diplomatic organization because we have to kind of uh, have them agree that uh, they cannot all do the same thing. Otherwise, we have uh, uh, seven sets of proportion in no side. So that's, uh, that's a little bit our, I would say, unique capability. Uh, very quick view 
for what we've done in the past uh, in science. These are some of our uh, older satellites, and in particular, of a certain interest is Mach 1, which went with uh, one liter of oxygen to the moon. So, the proving that electrical is actually very efficient in order to go. And this was a small sat that we did in order to, develop, to prove the electrical proportion that we would then use on uh, uh, Baby Colombo, that we'll see in a minute. Uh, and of course, Ulysses uh, was the first spacecraft to go above the poles of the sun. And Giotto opened the way to what has been Rosetta last year, being the first satellite getting very close to a comet. Now after that, we had Planck, which detected the first light of the universe, uh, Herschel, which mapped uh, uh, Starbirth, uh, Venus Express, which was also the first time we tried to do arrow breaking, and Rosetta, which we may have heard, which landed Philae on the comet uh, Tree Gerasimenko. So what we did, we uh, met with the comet and we landed uh, a spacecraft, uh, a small probe on it, about a hundred kilo probe. Now, uh, just a couple of quick points, uh, just to point out where these things are maybe a little bit more difficult than meets the eye. Um, Planck mapped the cosmic background uh, with a temperature difference of a million Kelvin, million Kelvin. So we have a map that shows the first anisotropies of the early universe in the first radiation light coming out, and the differences of these anisotropies are a few millions of a degree between one and the others. And of course, uh, to do that, we had to cool down the sensor to actually 0, 0, 0,08 Kelvin. So basically, it was the coldest point of the universe, as long as it had a cooling available. Uh, in Rosetta, what is interesting, and some of you are from economics perhaps, or have uh, project management in mind, <coughs> the Rosetta mission was selected in 94, uh, started, uh, it was ready in 2000, but then uh, we had a problem with the launcher, Ariane, so it was launched only in 2004, and it actually met the uh, comet at the end of 2014. So, you're actually talking of 20 years for your software, for your electronics, for your design of it. And in particular, during flight, it took about 10 years to get there, out of which three in total hibernation. Which means that the guys who actually designed the software had done that about 15 to 17 years before it actually had to work. And it had to work the first time. So this is what made satellites of this nature a little bit more expensive than other things. Not much chance to fix them. Need to keep the uh, groups alive and basically able to operate until the time we need it. I actually used to keep with my uh, colleague uh, head of operations and probably hibernated the team as well. <laughs> uh, whoops, that was That's probably that. not a good idea. Uh, we've landed on uh, uh, Titan, which is a moon of uh, Saturn, and I think your colleague is, uh, is working with some of the scientists that. Uh, are working over there, and that's uh, our, one of our records of being uh, furthest from uh, Earth, and of course we landed uh, on the comets with uh, Phila. 
Um, what are we going to do next? Well, right now we're, we have an instrumental novel of which we also have the first set of uh, solar rays. We have SOHO, which is slowly fading out and is looking at the sun. Uh, we looked at the X-ray universe with X and M units and uh, at the ionosphere with cluster and then integral is looking again at the XYs. Uh, Mars Express is still orbiting Mars uh, 14 years after its launch. Gaia is mapping all the stars. And Lisa Pathfinder is preparing for the next batch mission that will measure um, gravitational waves. You may wonder why you measure gravitational waves if LIGO has done it already. But in reality, gravitational waves are just other waves. So just as observatories look in different frequencies, the frequencies we want to look at from space are not the same frequencies that we looked at from the Earth, from ground and LIGO. And uh, this is really an open door to a new universe because we, we will be able to peer into an area of the universe which we don't see, we couldn't see without the gravitational waves. So for instance, uh, uncover a little bit the mystery of the black holes. Uh, what's coming up? Baby Colombo, electric propulsion going to Mercury. Uh, technically very challenging, both M and solar orbiter. They're about uh, one third of the distance between the Earth and the Sun which means they get about nine times the solar influx. So you're talking about more than 10 uh, kilowatts, or well, basically 12 kilowatts per square meter. That makes uh, a pretty interesting uh, thermal design to keep it working and not melting. Uh, Chaos, on the other hand, is looking at uh, the, the big uh, issue in planetology these days, that is finding planets around new stars. Uh, Euclid, trying to figure out what's uh, black dark matter, what it is and uh, what is really there. Juice, doing a grand tour of the Jovian moons. Plato, again, looking for, uh, uh, but looking better detail than Chaos into possible habitable uh, uh, planets around distant stars. And Athena, the, the child of Examan looking at uh, uh, X-ray universe. Again, one little parenthesis for those of you interested in the economies of space. Uh, the key technology we developed for the predecessor of Athena, which was called the XMN Newton, was lenses to focus X-ray onto the detector. These lenses were actually three golden shaped mirror, extremely precise shaped, nested, in order to focus this rays into the detectors themselves. The company who made those was a small Italian company. They got this as the biggest contract ever for them. They built them, they delivered them, and then of course, we didn't have another such satellite for 20 years. So they went back. And this one, 20 years later, uses a totally different technology. We're actually building the mirrors out of silicium wafers, bent individually. So it's got nothing to do with the technology that was built before. And the only thing we got a little bit smarter as we started building this technology, we started looking where it can also be used. So the company that is actually building this CDC mirror is also now discussing the possibility of using them in the medical industry. So hopefully they won't go bankrupt after they deliver to us. But that is one of the things uh, you have to bear in mind of the economies of our space activity. Uh, is that okay for you? Is this the right uh, level I'm saying? Uh, do you have any questions? Are you getting bored? Should I speed up? Should I slow down? I think this.
Okay, good. Third observation, as I said, is the largest we had. Uh, we have uh, uh, started out with MeteorSat, our first uh, uh, satellite for meteorology, then uh, starting with uh, ERS 1 and 2 in getting data of resources, and MBSAT, uh, we'll talk about it later as well, it was the largest satellite we ever made, and of course it's now our largest own piece of that. It's an eight-ton satellite, which is basically like a school bus. So, um, let me point out, we do three things in Earth observation. One, we have the Earth Explorers. And the Earth Explorers are exploring the science. They help the science to understand how the Earth system works. And uh, uh, just to give you an idea, because this is again a little bit of background, Gauche, uh, the most precise view of the Earth gravity field ever. The lab that made the sensor, called the gradiometer, started working on gradiometers in 1975. Uh, so this gives you an idea of the time it takes, and of course for about half of the time, they thought the best shape for a gradiometer was a ball. It was only halfway there that they decided not the best is a cube, because then you suspend it electrostatically, and it's much easier to get the signal like correct for the track. But that is what keeps, when people say, why did it take 10 years to make this mission? Well, because as we started discussing this mission, they were already 25 years into their sensors and they, hadn't, they weren't there yet. We were promising, but they weren't there yet in order to fly. And, and of course, that's one thing you need zero G to be sure that it works. So, <coughs> so that's uh, part of it. We are. These two are the similar problems. Uh, the development of the instruments has taken very, very long. And this is another issue in space matters. Uh, sometimes you tend to think, okay, satellite and instrument, same complexity. Not at all. We abandon doing that. We start now biomass flex and the next door the clouds. We start with the payload, with the instrument. That's the real challenging part. The platform you can almost have off the shelf right now, even if it's a very special. But the instrument is the tragedy. And when they speak about TRL, be very, very careful. Both of these sensors, which are basically based on the same uh, uh, laser system, were demonstrated uh, what they call TRL 5, 6 in the laboratory in space compatible methods. As soon as we move beyond that and add real space constraint and real building factors, well, we discovered that uh, at high power, the laser uh, created contamination that we didn't expect on the lenses. And uh, now we had it. Uh, it took another five years to try and solve that problem. Problem was, we had already started the development. So, five years, you have a whole team building a mission, and all of a sudden you have to stop everybody because in the lab they need to fix a problem. It takes five years to fix that problem. So, you cannot keep people for five years potting them around. So you keep some doing something, and the others you let go. So when you finally, five years later, you've solved your problem of the instrument, then you have to retrain people to start where you left off. And that takes you another couple of years. So that's, that's the kind of uh, funny industry we work in. <coughs> Meteorological missions, we do them for uh, AOMETSA. AOMETSA basically gives us the requirements 
we develop the satellite to satisfy them. And uh, I think we are pretty good. Uh, Ilmetsat is proud of our machines and we're proud of it as well. And then, uh, if I go back and look at the Earth Explorers, the science that comes out from here drives the type of uh, monitoring that you need to do. So, the first missions tell you how to derive a certain capa uh, knowledge on the Earth, and then you create sentinels that will monitor that constantly. So we have sentinels that do land and ocean service based on uh, uh, synthetic aperture radar, land monitoring and ocean forecasting based on uh, spectrometers and uh, actually ocean color, and then atmospheric monitoring, which is, of course, a key problem of these days. It's fine to know that CO2 is a problem. It's fine to know that uh, we have to do something about it. But who's actually able to detect where it comes from, where the most of it is coming from, etc.? And it's not only CO2 or other pollutants. So the capability of seeing it from space is fundamental. And lo and behold, pretty soon, your life insurer will tell you, what do you need in your world? Oh, you live in Paris? Let me see. Black Zone, minus 36 months of living expectancy. Well, of course, if you live in the middle of the Pyrenees, you die of boredom before that, but <laughs> it's all green. You can live 36 months longer. But that is what these satellites will feed into. Uh, not only that, of course, not only life insurance, but uh, the mapping of what this kind of uh, uh, pollution is coming from. Uh, again, let me remind you, if anything that you see there sounds interesting to you, you go on, your, on our website and you can go into much more detailed description of each one of these uh, uh, satellites, their signs, etc. You can also read it and say, but this is all wrong what he said. He didn't know. Could be. Uh, next, uh, we started out in telecom for Europe and it was kind of very interesting because in 68, sorry, where, and this is kind of a lesson for the startups in you. 1968, we are talking about a telecommunication satellite for you. And at that time, the biggest application for telecom satellites was telephony between Europe and America, America and Asia, etc. The intercept type application. And everybody said, why does Europe need a satellite? I mean, we got landlines all over the place. I can call anybody without going to a satellite. Why do I need it? So, in order to give it something to do, we put up an experimental payload to do TV broadcasting from the satellite. That's become the bread and butter of the telecom industry up till now. Well, of course, nobody watches TV anymore. <laughs> we all watch our websites and uh, our internet, etc. And then the delay from uh, geostationary is not that good anymore. So you got one web coming out and all 3D, etc. Et and that's that's where the thinking is changing once more, and is looking at a different approach to the solution. But you have to challenge the guys who say, nah. Not interesting, nah, not worthwhile. Uh, that was 68. That means that for almost 50 years, uh, EUTELSAT, uh, Space, uh, SES, Astra, etc., made billions out of diffusing television from something. So, uh, challenge the acquired knowledge. Artemis was an interesting satellite for two reasons. First one, it was the first inter-satellite linked by laser. So for years, we got the data of the Envisat we saw before by a laser terminal. The second one, it failed to reach orbit. And 
in a sense, that would be bad. But because we have experimentally put on top of some electric propulsion, it was actually the first geostationary satellite to get to orbit with electric propulsion. So, and it's interesting because that was back in 2001, and we still couldn't convince any of the operators that electric propulsion was a better way to get to orbit than chemical propulsion. Do you know what changed that? Let's be a little interactive here. Who knows what really changed the story? Who knows why really all of a sudden we got electric propulsion all over the place to raise the orbit of telecom satellite? Maybe collision between the Soviet Sorry, could you please? Maybe collision between the Soviet satellite and the American. I, I'm sorry, it's English. No, 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 it wasn't that. Uh, it was actually, as often in these cases, an unrelated story. <laughs> SpaceX. SpaceX came up with Falcon 9 and said, I'll take a small payload to GTO for 50 million, 60 million, something like that. When Proton, Ion 5, etc., will take uh, twice as much that load, but for 120 million. Then all of a sudden the economy is changed. Because the problem of electric propulsion takes you five to eight months to reach orbit. So if you're a telecom operator, you go to the bank, you take a loan, and you start repaying that loan with cash only when you start transmitting from orbit. If you get to stay six to eight months waiting for the damn satellite to get to orbit, forget about it. And that's why in 2001, we were unable, 2001 to 2015 or 14, we were unable to convince any of the operators to use electric propulsion. Even if the technical case was perfectly clear, enter SpaceX, Hey, you're talking about a difference of 60 million. That buys you a lot of money in the bank over six months. So all of a sudden, Boeing came up and said, hey, guys, you know what? We could launch two electrical satellites on SpaceX for 60 million and get them in GTO. And that's what you get. And all of a sudden, everybody is scrambling for it because satellites weighs almost half to go to GTO over the electric propulsion. But it took that, it took a totally unrelated fact, unrelated between brackets, but it took something that changed the economies that for everybody was fixed in the fact that if you did it that way, you had to pay six to eight months of interest without any cash coming. Um, we are supporting R&D for telecom and uh, we do the advanced research. Again, in Europe, there's no <coughs> military really driving this for the industry. Uh, so these are, we just launched a small geo. We're looking at the, uh, these two new version of our middle class satellites uh, that we call NEO, of course, like the Airbus and whatever. And Electra is a fully electrical version of small G. Um, EDRS is our system to communicate from space, uh, the child of Artemis that we saw before. Um, of course, ground segment is another area of importance. Um, I like to say that IRIS, which uh, I started when I was in the uh, telecommunication uh, area, it's a very interesting application because today, if you go on your Airbus, you look at the pilot cabin, full of electronics, nice screens, etc. You go into the airport, into the uh, operation center, full of electronics, fantastic computers all over the place. How do the computer on ground communicate with the computer in your plane? Sorry? No. That's what we dream of doing. 
by a voice between the pilot and the flight controller. The flight controller tells the pilot basically where it is, where it's going, and what frequency to use once it goes to the next controller. So it's 1940s technology, it's got VHF, and if passengers really knew about it, they wouldn't want to fly anymore. <laughs> That's why I take the train usually, even though I'm an aeronautic engineer. Uh, navigation, well, you know what navigation is for, you know Galileo, of course. What is getting very interesting is uh, we are moving to a new world of navigation. And especially when you think of 5G, uh, what's going to happen in the future? You're going to have to, you're going to have positioning within buildings, you're going to have very precise positioning in the street, you still need satellites. Well, it turns out, uh, if you want real precise positioning, nothing beats the sun. So we're still having some years in front of us, but what it's interesting as well, it's becoming a service. So for instance, Iridium Next will fly a payload for navigation services. So again, guys among you who want to start a new company, think about it. Positioning, navigation, great market for the future. The more you have, the more redundant you are, the less risk you have of your automatic driving cars bumping into each other, etc. <coughs> Agnos, uh, very, again, very interesting thing. Uh, when the Americans made GPS, they decided that, of course, it was done for military purposes, so the civilian could have only access to a very reduced precision signal. Uh, which didn't give them any better than uh, uh, several tens of meters precision. Uh, what, what determines the precision of the signal? It's, the, it's a function of your timing when you receive the signal, uh, which allows you to know precisely where you are with respect to the satellites themselves. But because the ionosphere changes continuously, there's always an error in the system. One way to kill the error is to have two signals on two different frequencies because then you can match the uh, difference into the two signals, figure out what the error is in the ionosphere, and have a more precise point. But civilians came up with a third way of doing it, which was, wait a minute, if I'm here and my GPS receiver tells me I'm over there, but I know where here is, then I know what the error is. And that's what you call WAS, Wide Area Augmentation System. And that's what we call ENGNOS, meaning you put a satellite in geostationary orbit, uh, you have stations on ground, especially near airports, which know precisely where they are on the ground. They get the signal from the GPS locally immediately. They figure out what the error is. They broadcast it to the geostationary broadcast it down, and every airplane equipped with this sees the precise place where it is and can land within a few centimeters, well, let's say 50 centimeters per season in position in the cast. Which is better than most equipment on aircraft today does. So it's and it's starting out for us. Uh, you want space flight? Well, uh, it's interesting here to see that there's a lot of cooperation with Russia for us. So International Space Station, ExoMars that we're working with uh, Russia over, Lunar Resource Lander here. While here we have a contribution from the Russians to ExoMars, here we have our contribution to the Russian land mission. <coughs> the European service model, it's interesting because uh, uh, some of you saw the movie Apollo 13. Okay, remember the part that failed, the service module? That's the one we're dying for the next capsule of NASA. So if, if they trust us to make that piece, it means we are somewhat good enough. 
not as good as Russia, but good enough. Uh, future human exploration, of course, uh, and, and our scientific exploitation. Uh, so we're partners on the space station. We have a module there. Uh, we used to transfer, we have our own transfer vehicle. Now it's over and we're doing this module for the Americans. This is our astronauts. Uh, and right now, this guy, Thomas Pesquet, no, this guy, Thomas Pesquet, is in orbit. Uh, Luca Parmitano is going to fly again. And uh, she's just become a mom. So, uh, which is a very important project in itself. So the next to fly is Paolo Nespoli, Alexander Guest, and uh, Luca Pamita. And ExoMars, we launched uh, last year, Trace Gas Orbiter, is around uh, Mars at the moment. We were testing the landing. It was a very good test. It showed what didn't work. So <laughs> we have all the data, we know what went wrong, but uh, instead of uh, uh, using his retro rockets for 30 seconds in order to slow down to almost nothing from three kilometers. He used it only for three seconds because the target was already on ground. So after three seconds, he stopped the retro rockets, turned on the experiments, and fell free for about three kilometers. So we have now a nice crater that we originally did not. <laughs> but Schiaparelli was actually the astronomer with our Martians were there excavating canals. So it's a proper fitting name for somebody who's made a hole in Mars. Uh, the next one, it's going to be this module, which is going to drill about two meters uh, depth under the surface of Mars. Because as you know, uh, Mars is kind of uh, without much of an atmosphere. So it's very much exposed to radiation. So if we want to find some traces of uh, formerly existing life currently existing life, then it's probably underground that we're going to find it. And while Curiosity can sort of scrape away at some rocks, this is going to go down, pick up the samples and analyze them. So hopefully uh, we'll see something. I always like to think that uh, luckily we have a camera on board. Because of course with all this equipment, if a radiation resistant chicken was passing behind it, it wouldn't know that radiation resistant life existed on Mars. How, how deep is going to two meters. Two meters. Two meters. Which should be enough to get to permafrost. So because of course as far as we know what you need is for life. It's uh, water and energy. And that's that's where we think you could find some or where it could have been. And there's of course a lot of cooperation on this, so uh, we're mapping with ExoMars, Mars, then contributed to the landing site's choice for Curiosity, and Curiosity is figuring out which are the best places for us to land our own lander. So in a sense it's like they have the robotic geologist, and we're going to put up the robotic biologist and see whether we can find something out, and Moon is of course our next uh, Objective. Um, do I know? Mm, yes, but you will just answer it what I think. Okay. Uh, launchers. This is today's family. I am five, Soyuz and Vega. This is uh, our crew base, conveniently placed uh, near the uh, equator. So good advantage for launching to Geo. Bad advantage if you want to go around because it's full of mosquitoes and malaria and stuff like that. Uh, this is the next step. And let's say from an economic point of view, what is becoming interesting is this is the heavy version, equivalent to an Ariane 5. This is the middle version, equivalent to Soyuz today. And this is the Vega C, a little bit grown up. But this first stage is the same as this boosters. So it means you have a on one production line for all the boosters. And that makes it a big advantage because today we launch a couple of two or three Vega per year. So if you have a production of, and we usually launch about five Ariane and five uh, Soyuz. 
So if you have 20 plus 10 plus 2 or 3, the individual cost is going to be much more convenient. And the two middle parts are going to be the same for, our S, for the two ISs. So there again, you're going to buy, build uh, probably 10 or 12 of these boosters a year, which again brings down the cost. We're not looking at recovering these stages yet. This is something we are looking into. And I'm totally fascinated by the way SpaceX is doing. So sorry, are you going to terminate the contract with uh, the consortium that provide for Soyuz? Uh, in theory, uh, we had already an agreement that was time limited mm -hmm. because Soyuz itself is going out of production with Amiara coming in. So that would open a whole new uh, discussion. Clearly, we have invested for launch capability in Kuru. We have replicated the kind of launching infrastructure that Soyuz has. So we're going to try and make the most of it as long as we have, because of course it's different from this guys. So yeah, that was the next question. Like, yeah. why, what are you going to do with all the yeah, infrastructure exactly. that you have? Exactly. Well, I mean, let's say uh, one of the fantastic things of Russian technology is that it is extremely pragmatic. So it's a big hole in the ground and four cranes. Okay. Which is a lot less than what the other guys spend not to be as reliable for all. <coughs> and of course we're looking at re-entry vehicles. In particular, we have re-entered one called I3 as aerodynamic re-entry, and now we're looking at being able to landing it. And this is our future programs of uh, technology, one of them which I don't know if I brought in, but it's, uh, I think it's particularly interesting is Sabre and Skyrim. And this is an engine that uh, will, have, will do air breathing, but by condensing air down uh, so that it can breathe oxygen from the atmosphere up until 20 kilometers high. That will increase enormously the ISP, reduce the mass of propellant you have to bring forward, and uh, it can either be a two stage two orbit or a single stage two orbit, or even an intercontinental plane type uh, engine. For the moment, what we've done, we've proven on ground that the most critical piece, the uh, heat exchanger, works. Uh, we have to now bring it to the point where we can test it in flight, after which, uh, so I think 2020 is what we're looking at for flight test of this type of thing. Uh, mission operations, uh, these are our colleagues from technology, they do uh, the operation of our, all of our satellites, and of course it's a very critical work, and they engineer the ground second for ESA. And uh, of course, uh, space situation awareness is the program where we look at space weather, space surveillance and tracking, and near our projects uh, uh, with the ground infrastructure. And really okay, so far. Let's see what time is it. You have time limited. Not us. It's uh, 4:35, and I have to leave now. 4:30. Ah, okay. So that was half the presentation. <laughs> this half is my stuff, it's technology. So let me fly to it. Uh, so, what do we do in technology? We support the competitiveness of our industry, of course. Transfer technology from space to non space and vice versa. Uh, trying to get some innovation in the uh, business and we have space incubators uh, across Europe which uh, transfer our technology toward commercial application. This is our sector of ESTEC and uh, I must say if you take all of the built area you see here is equivalent to your new center that you're building right now. So it's about, all of this is about 130,000 square meters you're building 136. For 3,300 people, here we are about 27. 
Uh, this is what we call the soft area. Offices, uh, um, uh, canteen, library, then these are offices, these are laboratories and offices, and down here, this is a testing area where we test our satellites before sending them to space. What we do there, basically, we do, uh, we figure out what the community wants, what the scientists want, what the microgravity people want, etc., etc., or observation. <coughs> we do a, a pre-design, CDF, concurrent design facility. Uh, out of that, we go to industry, uh, tell us what it costs and uh, how long it will take you to uh, do it. Then we go to our member states, get the money, go back to industry that says, oops, it's going to cost 20% more and it's going to take 30% more. So, okay, then the fight with the member states starts and we manage the industry through development until we get to delivery of the satellite test and ship it off. Uh, this is basically what we do. We get ideas, we get them from industry, we get them from uh, academia, our own people. Uh, we have initial uh, preparation of the future, initial studies, we also look at standardization harmonization with all the different actors in Europe and components development. We mature the technology, TRL 4 to TRL uh, 7, 8, and then finally we qualify the technology, eventually by flying it on demonstration. And of course, the objective is to have successful missions for ourselves, for our industry, and for our uh, member states. Now, what has changed really is up until the beginning of 2000 when the dot-com killed the telecom sector we're going back to a point where basically the equilibrium between state financed and commercially financed industry is about 50-50 which means we can no longer develop our technology only for our science programs we need to think of technology also for industry itself. So our technology strategy is basically based on four pillars. For industry, what's very important is cost and scale. These are the two factors. If you ask anybody in the space industry, what do you want? Reduce the cost, reduce the scale. Cost, because it's cost. Scale, because if I take longer, then somebody else is on the market before me and I'm done. Uh, of course, what is important from a government perspective is innovation. That's why member states invest in ESA R&D to try and stimulate innovation. And sustainability, because that is becoming a very key issue, uh, and we'll speak about it later uh, rapidly. So how do we translate this uh, type of uh, let's say, requirements into actual strategy. <laughs> we do this two ways. We have a top-down requirement from our missions. Hey, we want to measure the gravity of the Earth. We need a sensor. We need the technology to uh, contrast the drag of the atmosphere. We need uh, more uh, uh, performance satellites. Good. That's, that's what they need. Uh, we come in with cross-cutting initiatives that look at problems that are the same throughout all programs. So in particular, clean space, life cycle assessment, and that also means, have any of you heard about REACH? Okay, REACH is a European regulation which is targeting chemicals which are damaging to the environment. And they published lists that say uh, at that date this chemical will be outlawed. One notable example is in theory, if we don't have an exception, by 2020 we cannot use hydrogen. That's one example. 
clearly we're looking for an exception because there's no way we'll be ready in 2020 with green propellants. <coughs> but that's one problem. The other problem is most European member states have to have legislation that says, tell me how much pollution your industry produces. Tell me where you are in terms of economic, uh, ecological footprint with your industry. Whatever your industry is. It can be transport, it can be uh, supermarkets, it can be space telecommunication. Which then brings the question, what is the uh, footprint of a launcher or the production of a satellite? So this is what life cycle assessment is. CleanSat is not a satellite, it is a block of technology we want to use to make sure that the future satellites will not remain as debris. Uh, we'll look quickly on what is that. And if you can't uh, get them down by themselves, then you got to go get them. And that's what PD Orbit is all about. Uh, advanced manufacturing, additive layer manufacturing, new materials, design to produce, which is basically digitalization of production. And that also means uh, one, one example, when I look at what is the most costly part of the process of going from our concurrent engineering phase to actually ship out a satellite from ESA, the most expensive part in cost and schedule is assembly, integration and testing. And part of that is because we start thinking about assembly, integration, and testing only when we are already built half the site. Because we're not thinking like the guys who do planes or cars or whatever that say the first thing I have to figure out is not the performance, it's the production. Then the performance will try and make sure it works. We think the other way around. And this is one key point, and of course, people like Bob Webb have it very clear in mind, but we're still struggling because one web 600 satellite, so one. <laughs> so you have to, uh, I, I can tell you what the debate is going to be with our project manager. This is great, but I don't want to be the first to use it. <laughs> if I have to pay extra for the software or whatever, it's going to have a great success, but not on my project. It's like everybody wants nuclear energy, but not in my backyard. <laughs> uh, the other thing is bottom-up, which technologies you want. And we used to have all of those technologies you see there kind of singled out individually. But now, and this again when you look at your startup future, almost no one is really going down to the single piece anymore. You look for assemblies. You look for higher level assets. You look for putting these things together. So we have small startup next to Delft University. Uh, they made a bi-propellant propulsion system for CubeSats on 3D manufacturing, which is ideal because it doesn't have separate parts, doesn't have gaskets, doesn't have leaks. Fantastic. But that means it all can they they are a startup that provides you with something that has the electronics and everything in it. And that's, that's a little bit where, at least in the Western world, which is us, including Russia, the, the bread and butter is moving. Um, let me accelerate a little bit. I mentioned this in the orbit, cleans up what it is and the eco design. Uh, we have more than 4,000 inactive satellites in Leo. Uh, we should remove five large objects per year from orbit. This is what the experts say. Uh, let, me, let me give you a mental picture to play around with. Imagine that ships never sunk. That you would have on the Atlantic two pieces of Titanic still floating around, and all of the ships that were ever there. 
That's basically what happens above 600, 650 kilometers. They don't come down, they'll be there for hundreds of years. And of course, if you have in mind the shipping, where are they going to be? Where the most traveled routes are. So Leo is going to be some synchronous orbit. That's where you have the majority of those 4,000 plus. So the chances of them crashing into each other are of course not media. And when they do, they create a cloud of other pieces. And this is what uh, uh, a, a gentleman from NASA, Kessler, uh, called the Kessler syndrome. I mean, he studied how this would exponentially uh, create a, a cloud of debris which would make entire orbit unusable for the future. And this is why it's such a big problem. And now, we have a big problem in ESA to convince our member states to do something about it, is if you look at a map of the mass launched in orbit, uh, if you have US and Russia going like this, starting from the 60s, uh, Europe is barely visible at the bottom. So this is clearly a problem that we have to solve all together. But of course the big guys have more at stake than the small ones. But the ones that are in trouble, it's you guys. It's not being pension in two years. <laughs> so I'm done. But you guys, if you want to fly satellites in the future, Earth observation, etc., you have to think about this and convince when you vote, make sure they know about it. Uh, so, in order to make sure that the future ones come down, passivation, batteries explode, uh, the orbiting system, uh, stick an airbag in your CubeSat, it will come down. Uh, Design for demise. Today we have a rule of thumb because nobody had a science of that. For 50 years we tried to get things to land all in one piece. Nobody thought it was interesting to have them disintegrate when they re-enter. But now it's becoming very important because the population is increasing. So if we get to 9 billion people, mostly in the emerged areas, the chances of something coming down and hitting somebody on the head augment the same way. And today the rule of thumb is if your satellite in Leo is about 500 kilo, it will burn on re-entry. If it's above 500 kilo, pieces will come down. It's going to be the adapter ring, it's going to be uh, the, not the batteries because they will probably explode, but for instance, some pieces of electronics, some pieces of structure, they will come down. And one day somebody's going to get out of their head. So, can we study architectures and materials such that we can get up to about one ton and burn it completely on the edge? So if we do that, then most of our future Earth observation satellites will burn on the edge. And that's one of the interesting things. And if you want to go and get it, then uh, you fly up, uh, you run the boom and synchronize, you capture, and you stabilize it, and you bring it down. And this is what we do with the orbit. But this is very tricky because, of course, also the military are thinking of doing that for the spy satellites of somebody else. So uh, it's very difficult as a civilian to say I'm developing technologies that the military could use to get rid of somebody else's side. So it's a little bit of a tricky work, but again, eight tons of Envisat, if it smashes into another satellite, it's going to be a disaster. So that's, that's what we're trying to put forward. And of course, it's a lot of very interesting technologies because, for instance, Envisat is dead, so we don't know the position it has. Have to be, it's never meant to be serviceable. So you don't know where to actually grapple it. Um, it's an eight-ton satellite, so you don't want to tail wagging the dog. I mean, you 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 have to drag it down with something that hopefully it doesn't weigh eight tons. So uh, there are two ways we're looking at. Uh, 
R, grounded and fixed, and net and tether. Uh, net and tether, I'm a little bit skeptical about. It looks to me like a moped trying to drag a, a big truck across a frozen lake. Okay, they tell me it works. Uh, the arm looks more feasible, but it isn't. Because you have to be extremely careful in the way the, your GNC must be extremely fine at guidance, navigation, control, your propulsion. Because as soon as you touch, this thing is going to move. So you got to touch and grab, and it's not easy. <coughs> Very quickly. After just, just to keep you. Yeah. You have an airplane, don't forget. Okay. So <laughs> I'll move on to this. I just wanted to show you our small missions, uh, which we did this are about 120 kilos mission in particular. As you're looking at the fractionated uh, spacecraft, have a look at Proba 3 for mission flying. This for us is a test we are going to fly in 2019, and it's uh, two satellites that are going to fly at 150 meters distance with a precision of one to three millimeters and one arc sec in positioning, and they will basically be a coronagraph, the largest coronagraph ever flown to study the sun. Uh, this is why we do them, because they allow us to uh, test out the technologies and then we fly on our bigger missions. And we so-called retire the risk from the bigger missions themselves. And the reason I'm saying faster, cheaper, is because they're, as missions, they're faster and cheaper, but they're certainly not better than the big ones we do afterwards. In Proba 3, we're actually cheaper and better, but we're not faster. It's, it's taking a long time to get there. Uh, and we have a very small one, uh, 61 kilo, in order to look at a very small electric thruster for small satellite applications. This is where we go with our future small missions. A, it's a cooperation with the US, which actually comes from an original idea of Isa Carl Don Quixote. We'll try, you know, the Don Quixote story. Uh, so this is Sancho Panza. He's standing around and looking at what happens. And this is the Hidalgo coming and trying to spear the uh, windmill. And that's, that's what happens. That from uh, uh, applied physics lab will hit this uh, uh, small moon of this dual uh, uh, asteroid count, double asteroid count Deimos. And AIM will be there to look at what happens. Now, the problem is we didn't get it funded, so we're still trying to get it funded. We, were, we will carry, if we manage, two CubeSats. So we have these proposals for CubeSat to be there around what we have. And CubeSats are for us a very effective way to do technology demonstration, particularly GONX3. Uh, any of you know this? Uh, uh, flight rather 24? Yes. Okay. When we had our CubeSat flying, flight rather 24 could identify through our CubeSat the ADSB on the ocean. So we did that for a while with them. I think it's very interesting. And this is a small Danish company, again a startup. And uh, they're flying with us again uh, uh, this year or this summer with GOMEX 4. Uh, these are some of the things we do. Re-entry research, this is re-entry uh, material for uh, uh, future lifting bodies, tested in re-entry by CubeSat, atmospheric science, sound radiometry, and this is the one going it's for the next one coming, which runs on a propulsion and a CubeSat level hyperspectral imagery. And uh, yeah, this is more or less a plan for those. We're also asked for moon uh, 
QSATs. Last point, uh, I have a team which I call the advanced concept team, and it's a team of uh, postdocs, and they deal with fundamental physics, biomimetics, bioengineering, advanced proportion, mission analysis, space economics, nanotechnology, artificial intelligence, etc. I think we could get some interesting exchanges on that. They're all postdocs or graduates, so they do very interesting things. We come back to one last point before I miss my plane and I put you all to sleep. Uh, in here, there's an hyperspectral sensor, which is a CubeSat size, 10 by 10 by 10. And it's a very interesting story because again it has to do with a startup. And a small startup can't, well, they used to be small. They're successful, so they're not small anymore. They've got cosine, and they're in the Netherlands next to our center. <coughs> they start working for us on the scientific hyperspectral images. And the hyperspectral images are basically images that break down the light in the spectra and decide what are the chemical components on the spectra that they see. So they do this for us for the Earth observation. But they see that there's a chance to sell that to the food industry. It allows, for instance, to detect whether the fish is fresh or not, automatically. It passes under the images. There are chemicals which develop when the fish is no longer fresh. They are identified. But the operator of that machine is not a PhD. He doesn't read an hyperspectral image. He wants to get a signal that says good fish, bad fish. So they do that. They put in the electronics to analyze it and to give them just a good fish, bad fish. And then it hits them then. But that's the same thing as a farm. It doesn't want to see the picture of the hyperspectral image. It just wants to have a message, your field is too dry or it's okay, and that's all he needs. So, when you think of a CubeSat, actually the biggest problem you have is communication. You don't have a big antenna, you have this four, four little things and you have little power. So if you had to beam down an hyperspectral figure, a uh, picture, forget it. I'll take the full orbit to try and get down half of it. But if all your beaming down is a signal that says this is good, this is bad, then you can do it with this one else. And that's what you do. You elaborate on orbit, and you send down just what counts. So that's another little tale of the thing you can do uh, if you're young as one like you are, and uh, watch with interest all the good ideas that come out from you. So thank you very much. We have 10 minutes for questions if you have them, but as I suspect. <laughs> so thank you so much for your visit. <coughs> thank you. Thank you for having me here. I really enjoyed the visit. Fantastic place. I have a short time. Thank you very much for your presentation and the, you delivered it from the you know, economics point of view. You've told many times that
questions, etc. And then one of our colleagues just asked, how much does it weigh and how much does it cost? So we were turned around and thought, how can you be so stupid? I mean, look at this wonderful machine and that's all you have to ask. After 30 years of career, that actually is the only question you, have, you should ask. That's, that's in the end, as soon as you become a manager, that's your only question. All the rest can be sold, but uh, how much does it weigh and how much does it cost? It's in the end the only thing you want. Sorry. Any other questions? Yes, please. Oh, sorry. Uh, the mission of ESA. Lisa. Ah, Lisa mission, yeah. Uh, Lisa Pathfinder is testing out uh, in, in real life, that's the one it's in orbit, uh, the very sophisticated uh, light path for the uh, laser. The real mission will be Lisa itself. And I think if we go back, I think we want to fly it somewhere in 34. Let me try and... Well, Yeah, uh, 2029 is awfully close. Uh, however, there's clearly one point which may help, is the fact that, uh, so this is, see, 2034, but, Clearly, with LIGO coming online, demonstrating that it makes sense, that it may happen a little bit earlier. You know, when you, when you do this, you're talking about a mission that's going to cost around a billion, billion to hundred million. It gets much easier for a director to decide to do that once somebody else has demonstrated that gravity waves actually do exist. <laughs> So if you spend 1 billion, 200 billion of uh, taxpayer money and all you have to say is, well, we've demonstrated they are not existing in that frequency range, as the Americans say, not a great career move. <laughs> <laughs> yes? I have a question called Atom Technology. Who is doing this for you? And is it Frequency standard, time standard, what for? Uh, um, Cold atom technology. Cold atom technology is several labs. It's it's very it's a very uh, diffuse group of people. We have several labs in several uh, and member all, states. All these labs belong to ESA? No, no, no. They are external labs. Ah, okay. Actually, the way we work is. We work with external labs in activities which we see only once in a while. So, for instance, we have uh, we have a cooperation with uh, Rutherford Rutherford Appleton Laboratory in uh, Harvard, and they are working with us on cold atoms technology, frequency based, uh, and that's. That's part of the work we do, but we also work with Fraunhofer in Germany. And those are laboratories that deal, they are very specialized. They get a lot of funding from other entities, so it's good for us to kind of pop on. There are activities which are specific of space, and then we are the one who have the lab in-house to do that. So for instance, <coughs> We have very sophisticated labs for uh, uh, solar cells, testing them. If you imagine uh, uh, Rosetta went almost a billion kilometers away from the sun, uh, uh, Baby Colombo, and Baby Colombo and Solar Orbiter would be a one-third. You, you don't actually glue solar cells, you nail them. Because, so, so we have a lab which is very advanced in this kind of problems because nobody else has that kind of problem. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, sir.
вот это вам только рыбалочные системы. Вы вместо Present Project Well, we've been uh, toying around with it for a long time, and I think we'll toy around with it for another long time. Uh, I think basically you're looking at a couple of type of problems. First of all, uh, one, propulsion, you like to test it somewhere. Okay? John Wayne filming in Utah, a western in the desert. Half of the troop died a few years later of cancer. Never being tested in the Utah desert, not very far, or in the Nevada desert, not very far. Throwing everything in the atmosphere. It just came down on the troop of Joe Wayne. Uh, you don't want that. But if you have to do it underground, that requires a hell of a carbon. If you do it in space, uh, that requires a hell of an investment to see if it works or not. The other point, which I was hinting at this morning, uh, suppose I have a 100 megawatt uh, reactor. I have to transfer that 100 megawatt into something usable. So if I use a Rankine cycle or something like that for extracting electricity, which is, I mean, if you do it by uh, Peltier effect, uh, in Seebeck, you get 5%, 8%, something like that. If you do it by uh, Rankine or something like that, at best you get 25, 30%. That means you've got 70, 75, 75 megawatts to reject. And how do you do that? Simple, you put out radiators for 75 megawatts of the radiator for liquid, liquid uh, uh, lithium. Why not? But at that point, measure out how big they are and think if it isn't better to use solar cells. For the you don't care for No, okay, you can eat directly. But then you figure out that you got the worst of both worlds. Because you're going to use hydrogen in any case. You've got to keep frozen. And you are going to temperatures which are limited by the metals you use. So you're not exploiting all of the energy you get from your reactor. And you're not exploiting, therefore, all the advantages of this. So even Nervas get up to about 900 seconds. That wasn't a great deal. Why would you use it? If you're going to Mars with a manned mission, you want to use electric propulsion. Much better. I have to keep you in your place. Guys, a real pleasure to be here. Thanks a million. Can I, do you mind if I get a question?